Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we witnessed the tension-ridden and unstable reign of the Ashantahene Ose Ya Akoto. Ose Akoto, who gained a reputation for being drunk on 60-proof palm liquor every waking hour, allowed his disdain for the King of Juaben, one of the most important Ashanti cities, to escalate into a military conflict. The city of Juaben was besieged, and its inhabitants forced to flee into the southeastern outskirts of the Ashanti Empire. By the end of the king's disastrous reign, the Ashanti realm was teetering on the brink of civil war. However, luckily for the empire, the emotionally unstable, drunken ruler succumbed to his binge-drinking habits after eight years on the Golden Stool. With that, the burden of picking up the scattered pieces of Ashanti power fell to Oseya Koto's heir apparent, Kwako Joa Panin, who will prove to be the polar opposite of his successor in every way, for better or for worse. Season 3, Episode 19, Kwako Joa Fixes a Broken Empire The Ashanti Empire that Kwako Joa inherited in 1834 was enraptured in what I can only call an unusual state of affairs. On the one hand, it's not like he was inheriting a fundamentally broken state. While the empire had recently become enveloped by a series of crises under his predecessor, the beginning of Kwakojoa's rule was only a decade or so removed from the peak of Ashanti power under Osebonso. But, beyond merely needing to restore the stability of the Ashanti state, Kwakojoa also faced greater challenges. The world of the 19th century was a rapidly changing one, and Kwakojoa knew that if the Ashanti Empire was going to survive and thrive in the coming decades, a return to the old status quo would not be sufficient. But let's back up for a moment. Who exactly is this Kwakojoa guy who I keep bringing up anyways? And how does he even end up on the golden stool? Well, he's no newcomer to our show. In fact, he's kind of been lurking in the background present at many of the events that we've covered in our last few episodes, but always shying just out of the spotlight. So, the not-yet-Ashantahene Kwakojoa was born in the year 1797. He was born to a cadet branch of the Ashanti royal family that was completely distinct from that of his predecessors. Osebonso and Oseyakoto were, of course, descended from the mini-dynasty of Kanadoyadom, the woman whose rise to power we chronicled several episodes back. Kwakojoa, on the other hand, came from a totally separate lineage. Similarly, his mother was also a woman who married into the royal family, entering into matrimony with one of the old Ashantehane Ose Kwajo's sons. Now, this pedigree wasn't exactly one which screams future Ashantehane. Sure, his mother was vaguely a member of the royal family through marriage, but, like, so were a lot of people in the Ashanti Empire. Pretty much every Ashanti family of some degree of import had at least one relative who had married into the royal family at this point. So, Kwakojoa's teenage and young adult years more resembled the life of any other mid-level member of the Ashanti elite. He was awarded a minor in Safohene title by Osebonso, and apparently he did an alright job as a bureaucrat. However, the young bureaucrat's rise to fame began during the war against Jaman. Kwakojoa, having just turned 20 at the time, was conscripted into the Ashanti army. However, due to a combination of his noble background, his bureaucratic title, and his skills that he showcased in training camp, the young Kwakojoa gradually rose up the army's ranks, and eventually even attained an officer position. During the war, he earned renown for his bravery and battlefield acumen at the Battle of the Tyne River, and was rewarded with wealth and prestige by the Ashantehene for his efforts. He also participated in the Battle of Nsamanko, when the Ashanti army wiped out Charles McCarthy's invasion force. His wartime service here is where he earned his nickname. Much like his predecessors, Kwako Joa was not the future Ashantehene's birth name. Kwako is a common Akan name, which means born on Wednesday. But Joa is a bit more unusual. It means tree. During a part of the battle, which just so happened to take place on a Wednesday, the young officer apparently showcased immense bravery, and was compared to a tree, rooted in the ground and unmoving in the face of danger. From this bravery, he earned his nickname, the tree born on Wednesday, Kwakojoa. Then, in 1826, Osebonso died. With his status as a war hero entrenched and his celebrity growing, Kwakojoa became something of a popular pick among many movers and shakers in the Ashanti government to become the new heir after Oseakoto. After all, Oseakoto had no more male relatives and no legitimate nephews who could succeed him as the next Ashantahene. 
After all, Osekoto had no more male relatives remaining, as he had only become the Ashantahene himself because his brothers kept dropping like flies. So the choice for who would become the heir fell entirely upon an election. The Ashante Manhyamu, or National Assembly, convened in Kumasi, and in a sweeping victory, the young and charismatic war hero won the nomination. With this, there was only one more hurdle to jump. The Ashanta Hema, Oseakoto's half-sister, had to approve of Kwakojoa's appointment as the new heir. However, she herself had not birthed any children who were realistically viewed as candidates for succession, so she approved of Kwakojoa's selection. With the Queen Mother's endorsement, Kwakojoa was now the official heir apparent to the Golden Stool, and next in line to become the Ashanta Hene. But, well, being the heir apparent to Ose Bonso is not necessarily a great position to hold. I mean, yes, you are said to be destined to inherit a great deal of power, which sounds awesome, but you also have to put up with Ose Akoto, the drunken Ashanti king who is prone to deep bouts of paranoia. The guy who would go on to wage a full-blown war against his own countrymen and execute a respected nobleman just for associating with one of his rivals. Being the heir to the Golden Stool guaranteed that Kwakojoa would become a principal subject of Osebonso's paranoia, and was just as likely to send Kwakojoa to an early grave as it was to send him to the palace. And throughout his tenure as heir apparent, Kwakojoa got more than his fair share of abuse from the perpetually paranoid Akoto. Almost immediately after Kwakojoa's election to the position of heir, the Shantahane exhibited immense suspicion towards him, especially after the Battle of Katamanso. Remember how the Jwabenhene Boaten had brought back the Golden Stool after the king had lost it during his hurried retreat, and how the king erupted in an angry tantrum and accused Boaten of stealing precious stones off of the stool? Well, Kwakojoa had actually accompanied Boaten during his journey to retrieve the stool, so he too was bombarded with accusations of thefts. However, and this was the key to his success, Kwakojoa knew exactly how to handle this type of personality. While the Jwabenhene loudly protested his innocence, Kwakojoa knew better than to antagonize the unstable Ashantahene. He meekly apologized for any offense to the king. Throughout Kwakojoa's time as heir apparent, he was noticeably tentative with his language and conduct, frequently walking on eggshells to avoid provoking the easily offended Oseakoto. In fact, because of his genuflection, the heir gradually acquired the Ashantahene's trust, and became one of his most senior advisors. As the king's advisor, Kwakojoa developed a reputation as the more level-headed and competent of the two royals, often advising Oseakoto against rash and poorly considered ideas. He was, in a sense, the little abosom on the king's shoulder. So, when Oseakoto's drinking habits caught up to him in 1834, many in the Ashanti government underwent a burst of enthusiasm. Oseakoto, the easily offended and often inebriated Ashantahene, was now replaced by his more capable and mild-mannered heir. And, at least in the first few years of his reign, Kwakojoa fulfilled this expectation as a return to normalcy in the Ashanti palace. His first priority was to clean up the mess his predecessor had made, most notably the ongoing crisis with the people of Joabin. If you recall, during the final years of his kingship, Kwakojoa's predecessor had led an invasion of Joabin, the second most important city in the Ashanti Empire, and forced its inhabitants and the king to flee into the neighboring Achim province. This was causing all sorts of problems. For starters, the depopulation of one of the most economically and politically important cities in the Ashanti Empire was causing serious harm to the Ashanti's economy. Not to mention, the refugees were not necessarily getting along well with their Achim hosts, leading to mounting unrest in the perpetually unstable Achim provinces. If tensions got any worse in Achim, it was only a matter of time until the region once again erupted into conflict. So, eager to prevent a potential disaster, Kwakojoa's first order of business was to get the people of Joaben to return to their home city. This wouldn't be as easy as it sounds. The Joabenhene Boaten was skeptical about the king's intentions. After all, despite his reputation as the more level-headed party in the royal palace, Kwakojoa had been complicit with Akoto's attack on Joabin. Kwakojoa was one of the elites who Boaten had hoped in vain would rise up against Akoto and force the Ashantahene to stop his war against Joabin. But he hadn't. To Boaten, this sudden invitation to return to Joabin by someone who had been, you know, complicit in the war against his people must have looked like a trap. So, desperate to convince Boaten to return, Kwakojoa sweetened the deal. If the Joabenhene and his people returned, 
He promised that he would not only pardon them of all criminal charges Osekoto had leveled at the people of Joaben, but he would also forgive the government debts of the entire population of Joaben. This deal was too good to refuse. Boaten and the majority of his subjects cautiously returned to their homeland, where they tentatively resumed their old lives. Some of his subjects would stay behind, establishing a permanent Ashanti minority population outside of Chebi. By convincing the Joaben Hene to come back to his home city, Kwakojoa had already made some substantial progress in undoing the damage of his predecessor. However, there were still three problems that needed to be dealt with. These problems were Oseakoto's drinking buddies, the twins Atapanen and Atakoma, as well as the rapist Kochako, who were all still free men roaming the streets of Komasi and causing as much trouble as ever. Now, Kochako was easy to deal with. He hadn't exactly tried to get away with his crime, figuring that his friend the Ashantahene would be there forever to make sure that nobody came after him for it. But in terms of criminal justice, it was easy to prove. There were tons of witnesses who were willing to share that they had seen Kochako running away from the Joabin's house on the alleged night of his crime. The evidence was enough, and with the writing on the wall, Kochako confessed, and was publicly strangled to death. Dealing with the twins, though, would be a bit more troublesome. Unlike Kochako, who was just some guy who happened to be friends with Osei Koto, the twins came from a powerful noble family. These family connections ensured that prosecuting them wouldn't be easy, as any charge that was viewed as even a little short of set in stone could provoke intense backlash from their powerful family. Not to mention, the twins were a lot less stupidly brazen with their crimes than Kochako. Most of their obnoxiousness was derived from their general sense of entitlement and drunken shenanigans, rather than frequent violent crimes. And when they did commit crimes, which usually consisted of assaulting random people for not offering them praises when they passed by them on the street, their targets of abuse were almost always either commoners or enslaved people, who lacked the connections to try to fight against a powerful noble family in the Ashantahene's court. But, well, all Kwakojoa had to do was to wait for the duo to mess up, and go just one step too far. Eventually, they did. And, as with last episode, this is an adult content warning. If you're a parent listening with children, or a teacher listening with students, you might want to skip this next part. A few years into Kwakojoa's rule, the twins started having an affair with a slave woman. I'm not even going to get into the minefield involving whether or not an enslaved person can properly consent to sex with that sort of power dynamic hanging over them. In my opinion, the answer is no. So it might be more accurate to say that they were raping a slave woman. Regardless, one day the woman's husband returned and uh, caught the twins in the act. Yes, both of them at the same time. Weird. In revenge, the woman's husband decided to publicize the affair telling everyone in Komasi about how the respected sons of a noble family were hooking up with a lowly, married slave woman. When word started to get around, any respect that the young nobles held in Komasi social circles evaporated. Used to facing no consequences for this type of behavior, the two brothers hatched a plan for revenge. One day, they found the upset husband and murdered him. They didn't even make much effort to hide it, either doing so in broad daylight in front of multiple onlookers. Whatever, though. They had committed violence against enslaved people countless times in public before, without consequences. So, what was one more? Well, this is where the twins could have used a better understanding of Ashanti law. While, yes, the husband was enslaved, he was one of the distinct class of enslaved people who belonged to an abosoa, and therefore was afforded extra legal protection under the Ashanti law code. Remember, inter Abosua violence was a real threat to the social order in the Empire's early years, so this type of offense was taken seriously. Additionally, it's worth remembering that their old drinking buddy, the Ashantahene, was gone. In his place was a new Ashantahene just looking for an excuse to lock these guys up. So, if they had expected another slap on the wrist, they had another thing coming. Now armed with the opportunity that he had been waiting for, Kwakojoa finally decided to rid the empire of the last obnoxious vestiges of his predecessor's disastrous rules. After committing such a serious and undeniable crime, even the twins' family didn't bother putting up much of a fight to defend them. The old drinking buddies of Oseakoto were put on the chopping block. So, with the king of Joaben back in Joaben, and Oseakoto's rakish friends no longer a problem, Kwakojoa had finally restored Ashanti society to a state of normalcy. Everything in the Ashanti government was mostly back as it had been in 1823. So, with that said, the Ashanti Empire is now back in a healthy state and ready to resume its golden age, right? 
Well, no, far from it, actually. Yes, while Quakojoa had quickly mopped up the most scandalous elements of his predecessor's rule, the empire he now ruled faced many problems with deeper roots than Osekoto's incompetence. While the conservative elites of the Ashanti Empire may have desired a return to the old status quo, Kwakojoa knew that, for several reasons, a return to normalcy meant a return to disaster. For starters, the Ashanti economy had been in a state of absolute freefall since even before Osekoto's rule had begun. Unemployment had grown considerably while productivity had declined. If something wasn't done quickly, the Ashanti economy could face long-term economic recession or even a lasting depression. The factors behind this economic decline were fourfold. The most significant cause of the Ashanti's economic decline in the early 19th century was the abolition of the slave trade. As we saw a few episodes back, starting in 1807 and lasting throughout the next decade or so, almost every country in Europe and the Americas abolished the international slave trade. To clarify, they didn't abolish slavery as a process, but made illegal the importation and exportation of enslaved people. While definitely a win for human dignity and rights, the abolition of the slave trade proved disastrous for the Ashanti economy. For centuries, the exportation of human beings from neighboring countries had fueled the Ashanti Empire's meteoric economic growth. In the short term, the trade was incredibly profitable. While prices varied by era, enslaved people from Ghana usually fetched a price somewhere near the modern equivalent of 300 US dollars, with the price peaking around the equivalent of 500 dollars in the mid 18th century. At first, this sounds shockingly low, especially when you consider that this is a price that we're putting on the head of a human being with a soul and family, but when you consider the enormous quantity of captives that even a single war could produce, it's easier to imagine just how wealthy Ashanti merchants became off this trade. The abolition of the transatlantic slave trade cut off this key revenue stream. While a few countries, namely Brazil and some other states in Western and Northern Africa, continued the slave trade for several decades longer, the combination of lower demand and British efforts to intercept slave trading vessels made this trade relatively unprofitable. Coincidentally, or perhaps because of the end of this transatlantic slave trade, the long-term drawbacks of a slave trading economy became more apparent. Depopulation of the Ashanti's neighboring regions, caused by the taking of slaves during wartime and as tribute, dramatically stunted economic productivity outside of the core of Ashantiman itself. It also shrunk the size of the market for Ashanti goods. There were fewer potential customers for Ashanti manufactured goods in the regions surrounding them, which harmed demand for Ashanti products more generally. Of course, enslaved people were not the only products that the Ashanti sold to European merchants. And, God, it feels so weird to refer to people as products, but remember, that's just how enslaved people were viewed back then. But, yeah, the abolition of the slave trade did not terminate trade altogether between the Ashanti and Europeans. Far from it. In fact, the end of the slave trade allowed Ashanti merchants to continue exporting gold, kola nuts, ivory, and spices at an even higher rate than before. With gold, of course, being the most valuable commodity by a great margin. These remaining exports were valuable, but they were not sufficient on their own to balance European imports like rum, firearms, salt, and cowrie shells. This resulted in the creation of a major trade deficit, in which the Ashanti Empire bought much more than they sold to foreign merchants. This trade deficit became even more pronounced during wartime, as the demand for imported firearms skyrocketed, without an equivalent increase in export demand. Now, trade deficits are not inherently bad for an economy, and can even be a sign of rapid economic expansion, but when coupled with a decline of the value of existing exports, it can result in some really negative consequences. And in 1828, with the discovery of several major gold mines in southern India and the southeastern United States, global gold prices briefly retracted. Declining gold prices hit the Ashanti economy like a train in the following years. With prices declining, Ashanti gold miners decreased their sales to merchants, who, in turn, could now import fewer European goods. The most important of these goods was cowries. As we've talked about before, the plentiful volume of gold in the Ashanti Empire made gold too unstable to be a reliable currency, so a great deal of Ashanti trade made use of cowrie shells, a much more scarce and valuable product, than the ever unreliable gold. However, as gold prices decreased, quantities of imported cowries also fell. This resulted in an economic phenomenon called deflation. The opposite of the more well-known inflation, deflation occurs when a currency becomes more valuable. The price of a bar of salt, for example, 
fell from 8,000 calories in 1805 to just 7,500 calories in 1828. Now today, it's pretty common for people to think of inflation as an inherently bad thing. So deflation must then be great, right? Well, if you hold a large savings account, then yes, all of those calories you've been saving are now worth even more. Now that's nice for people with a lot of money, but what if you owe somebody debt? Because of deflation, your debt would gradually increase. And remember, the Yashanti social custom was that if a working class person fell too deep into debt, they could find themselves in a sort of pseudo-slavery known as debt penage, sometimes also called debt bondage or indentured servitude. They would work as unfree and unpaid labor for a time in exchange for debt forgiveness, and were then re-released as free peasants upon the elimination of their debt. But with deflation growing the magnitude of Ashanti private debts, more and more people were pressured into penage for longer and longer terms. The growing number of people in penage became a significant problem for the Ashanti economy. Due to their working for debt relief rather than wages, people in penage and enslaved people more generally were essentially non-participants in the Ashanti domestic consumer economy. They did not buy anything, which meant that their growing population was a blight on Ashanti domestic producers. And the kings of Ashanti had made these economic problems worse by fighting devastating and expensive wars in the south for... what exactly? That's right, access to the coast where they couldn't even sell slaves anymore. Which brings us back to Kwakojoa. In the early 1840s, after decades of these economic problems compounding, the Ashanti economy was increasingly falling into a downward spiral. Kwakojoa knew that he had to act fast and that any salvation from these cascading economic problems would require unprecedented solutions. So, in an effort to save the Ashanti economy, Kwakojoa initiated a series of reforms that introduced unheard levels of state regulation into the economy. Most importantly, the deflation and personal debt crisis had to be alleviated. Kwakojoa and his advisors arranged for a meeting with the Dutch, in which they personally ordered an enormous shipment of cowries in 1845. To pay for these cowries, Kwakojoa personally ordered for the imposition of a new graduated tax on inheritance. That is, the more wealth you inherited, the greater percentage of the wealth you paid in tax. He then used this revenue not only to pay for more cowries, but also to enact a system of personal debt relief, helping people in penage from throughout the empire work through their owed labor time. By using revenue primarily collected from the empire's wealthy elites and delivering it to indebted peasantry, Kwakojoa was essentially enacting what we would call today a welfare state or social safety net, a policy which had great success. Throughout the 1840s, the number of Ashanti in debt penage gradually stagnated and then began to recede, and the value of cowries began to once again decline. The economy was finally recovering. However, it was far from fixed, as the root cause of the Ashanti's economic woes, the decline of gold prices and the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, persisted. The decline in global gold prices wasn't something that Kwakojoa himself could choose to fix. No matter what policies he personally enacted, the new gold mines in the United States and India would stay open, and gold prices would stay low. So, instead, he opted to try and improve Ashanti gold mining techniques. To help him with this task, he turned to who else but the Dutch. The Dutch people have always had a bit of a reputation as great engineers. After all, besides marijuana and tulips, what are the most famous icons of the Netherlands? Of course, it's their well-engineered dams and windmills. In the 19th century, Dutch engineering was the envy of everyone across Europe. So, who better to help the Ashanti improve their own engineering techniques than the Dutch? Kwakojoa hatched a plan. He would send his 10-year-old son, Kwesi Boache, and his nephew, Kwame Apoko, to the Netherlands to learn Dutch engineering techniques. During a diplomatic meeting with the Dutch ambassador, which was ostensibly regarding the acquisition of more up-to-date firearm models from the Dutch in exchange for the Ashanti provision of soldiers to help the Dutch police their colonial holdings in Southeast Asia, Kwakojoa slipped in a provision that would allow Boache and Opoku to attend a Dutch engineering school for 10 years before returning to the Ashanti Empire, and instructing others on what they had learned. It was a great plan, but one that ultimately ended in failure. Both of the cousins shipped out from the Netherlands, but would never return, albeit for entirely different reasons. Boache, who excelled in his new profession as an engineer, 
grew attached to his new life in the Netherlands, and eventually decided not to return to his home in the Ashanti Empire. Opoku, on the other hand, desperately wanted to return home, but after returning home to Ghana, he realized just how estranged he had become from his own culture. After a prolonged and crippling identity crisis, he took his own life. If you're interested in learning more about the simultaneously captivating, tragic, and deeply emotional biographies of the two cousins torn between cultures, then you will enjoy our premium episode that covers the life of these Ashanti cousins before, during, and after their period of study in the Netherlands. To listen, simply pledge to support the show on Patreon. Not only do you gain access to countless fascinating premium episodes, including this one, but you also get to help support our commitment to free online history education. To be completely honest, a lot of stuff has been going on in my life as I've been making this podcast, especially in recent weeks. I recently got a new job, which, while I love it, has made my schedule incredibly busy. For a brief moment when we were between editors, I clocked the amount of time that I put into this podcast and my job and found out that I ended up working a combined 80-hour week one week just to get the show out on time. Bringing in a new editor has certainly helped this problem a little bit, but it's still become increasingly difficult to push out episodes of the show. I love making the show. While researching and writing the show about topics as obscure as some of the stuff we cover is very hard and very work-intensive, it is also very rewarding. But to be honest, I don't think I'd be able to make this show happen without your guys' support on Patreon. So, to those of y'all supporting the show, thank you so much. Without your support, I estimate we probably wouldn't have made it past the halfway mark of Season 2. So, if you want to join the amazing people who allow this show to continue even as my schedule becomes more and more demanding, please support the show on patreon.com slash historyofafrica or on our support the show link on the podcast blog. And to those of y'all who have already been supporting the show, I cannot emphasize enough how grateful I am. While his plan to improve Ashanti mining techniques ultimately failed, even then the Ashanti economy saw considerable success in reinvigorating itself under Kwakojoa's guidance. For the most part, this can be attributed to Kwakojoa's debt forgiveness policy, freeing many Ashanti workers from penage, allowing them to participate in the larger Ashanti consumer market. From 1843 until 1850, the imperial economy improved from a stagnant mess into something resembling the prosperity of old. However, while the Ashanti's economic woes were finally declining in severity, it should be noted that this economic success stood balanced on a thin wire. The Ashanti economic recovery was a recovery fueled by massive amounts of state funding. And, of course, this state funding was itself underpinned by an enormous tax burden on elite inheritance. Needless to say, Kwakojoa's policies made him many enemies in elite circles. Many of the state's bureaucrats, governors, nobles, and merchants deeply resented his new debt relief policies and the taxes that he levied to fund them. While the state as a whole benefited from the decline in debt penage, besides just the taxation issue, these were also the people who were, in many cases, holding the debts that were being forgiven. While the state's economy as a whole benefited from the decline of debt penage, the increasing labor costs that came with, you know, not being able to temporarily enslave your workers for as long, made it so personal fortunes of the elite classes suffered. The landowning nobility, and Omanhenes in particular, were livid that the armies of peons who worked their estates were now, get this, able to realistically pay off their debts before they died. To counteract this growing resentment, Kwakojoa unleashed a darker side of his personality. More so than any Ashantahene before or after him, Kwakojoa truly embraced a form of royal authoritarianism. In the past, Ashanti kings, even the bad ones, had acted as, essentially, constitutional monarchs. The position of Ashantahene was, in theory, an elected one, and every law had to be approved not only by the Kotoko Council, but also by both houses of the Ashanti parliament. However, Kwakojoa ran into a roadblock when trying to pass his controversial debt relief plan, calorie importation plan, and estate tax. Remember, few if any Ashanti elites approved of these policies, or ever would, so nobody in the Ashanti Manjiamu was willing to even consider supporting the idea. Kwakojoa's solution? Simply ignore them and just enforce the law anyways. In a move of unprecedented absolutist ambition, Kwakojoa had basically decided that his will alone was enough to make law. But, I mean, how does this even work? How does this not provoke strong backlash from Ashanti elites? 
But Ashanti political elites had impeached and overthrown kings for less, much less, than this in the past. So what stopped them from calling for Kwakojoa's removal when he made it clear that he didn't care about their input and enacted a controversial law despite the objections of the entire parliament? Well, Kwakojoa had some pretty good reasons to expect that he would emerge the winner in this political gambit. For starters, he controlled the respect of the country's military. Remember, Kwakojoa had practically started his civil career as a military officer, so he was incredibly popular among the army. It didn't hurt that his government generally favored military elites over non-military elites. In particular, he appointed a close military ally, Owosu Koko, to run many affairs of the Ashanti state. Owosu was a man with a great deal of military experience, due to his position as the Amanhene of the Ashanti's Achim province, one of the most volatile provinces in which he had to crush near-constant revolts early in his career. This province also held the largest permanent Ashanti garrison. Shoring up his reputation with one of the Ashanti's most important military leaders, Kwakojoa awarded Owosu with a great deal of power over domestic and military politics alike, elevating him to be, essentially, the de facto second most powerful man in the empire. His imposition of new taxes was also coupled with constant funding increases for the permanent elements of the Ashanti army, further bolstering their loyalty to the Ashantihene. Not to mention, the king was probably quite popular among the massive class of people who had benefited from his debt relief policies. While we don't exactly have polling data from back then, I would be very surprised if the policy of giving indebted Ashanti free money to pay off their crushing debt didn't win Kwakojoa any substantial support from the working class. I doubt that many Ashanti politicians were willing to back any sort of suicidal attempt to remove a king so popular with both the Ashanti working classes and military. To further bolster the security of his power, Kwakojoa turned to more, well, conventional means of enforcing his will. Unlike his predecessor, who had a reputation for essentially letting the state govern itself while he drank all day, Kwakojoa kept an incredibly tight control on the Ashanti justice system. Not only was he more active in personally inserting himself into even minor criminal trials, the Ashantihane also developed a reputation for handing out significantly more punitive rulings than previous rulers. In past decades, crimes like theft, provocative language, and other relatively minor offenses could land the offender a hefty fine, or sometimes even just a mandatory public apology. Under Kwakojoa, the death penalty became the default verdict for all crimes, even minor ones. Now, we don't have the data to know if this was effective at reducing crime, but we can speculate that it was certainly effective at terrifying anybody who even considered plotting against the Ashantihane's interests. The spree of executions that continued throughout Kwakajoa's rule deeply puzzled foreigners living in or near the Ashanti Empire. The Dutch in particular had no idea why Kwakajoa was so comparatively willing to render the death penalty for minor offenses. In fact, this is part of what helped facilitate the earlier deal for the royal cousin's journey to the Netherlands. The Dutch, observing Kwakajoa's preference for capital punishment, figured that this meant that the Ashanti must have possessed a vastly larger population than the Dutch had previously believed. Reportedly, one confused Dutch envoy asked Kwakojoa himself why he was killing so many of his subjects. Kwakojoa provided a response that really enlightens us to his philosophy regarding criminal justice. White people think that I kill my people for nothing, but this is not so. If I were not to kill them when they commit theft and other crimes, order would be lost. Basically, any cost in blood is worth it, if it means preserving stability. Kwakojoa was a Hobesian sovereign in the truest sense of the term. Perhaps surprisingly for such a despotic ruler, Kwakojoa's dictatorial time on the Golden Stool was long and peaceful. Perhaps an illustration of his desire to right the Ashanti's proverbial ship, he didn't lead any efforts to conquer new territories. Rather, every war that the Ashanti fought under his tenure was defensive in nature, that is, to preserve what the Ashanti had already conquered. In 1841, the Ashanti's northernmost vassal, the Kingdom of Dagbon, decided to cease paying tribute to Komasi, and even supported a small faction of rebels who sought to secede from the Ashanti Empire. Kwakojoa, unwilling to let these regions slip away from his influence, marched an enormous army north and brutally crushed the nascent revolt. Besides this rebellion, his reign was, for the most part, peaceful. Well, that is, if we ignore the last few years of his rule. 
In 1863, an Ashanti fugitive, fleeing the punitive judgment of Kwakojoa, escaped across the Praw River into British-administered territory. By escaping to the south, this fugitive kicked off the next entry in the long list of Anglo-Ashanti wars. This conflict, despite being largely relegated to a footnote in mainstream history, will fundamentally and irrevocably transform the political landscape of southern Ghana. This war represents a turning point for both the British and Ashanti empires, and nothing after will ever be the same. Join us next episode as we take a long look at the context, battles, and political implications of the Second Anglo-Ashanti War. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Penza, Tobias Tunglin, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, and Conrad Schwenke, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means a lot.